afternoon. Um, this is the uh, Nanoscience and Quantum Information Building uh, up the hill from here at the University of Bristol. The building performs a number of functions. It's a very high spec building for doing cutting edge science, but it also fulfills a different role. So what is nanoscience? Nanoscience is the study of matter at the nanoscale, that is between say one and 100 nanometers. So the question is, what is a nanometer? Well, it takes 100,000 nanometers to make the width of a human hair. So nanometers are very small, and atoms are even smaller than nanometers. But nanometers and nanostructures are found in all areas. It's not just physics, it's not just chemistry, it's also in biology. There are, of course, nanostructures in biology, in biochemistry, and of course in medicine and engineering. So this is a field totally interdisciplinary where uh, this idea of nanoscience spreads across many disciplines. And this building houses people from all those disciplines who are doing experiments. What we need to do is to bring those people together so that they can cross-fertilize the ideas between those different fields. And this fits very well with the talk we've just heard from Steve Johnson. How do we do that? Well, this is one of the finest coffee shops in the area. So we have, down here, we have a very nice coffee room where people from across different disciplines are most welcome to come and share their ideas and their problems about what they're doing and discuss. Looking more carefully at this, I think we regressed a bit from coffee to red wine. <laughs> the other thing that we do, of course, is this building is extremely high specification. If we're talking about things that are atomic scale, we need to make sure the building isn't vibrating anywhere near the atomic level. So how do we do that? Well, we spend a long time designing the building to have extremely low levels of vibration, particularly in the basement. So here's a, a typical lab in the basement where you're looking here at a scanning tunnel and microscope based on a concrete slab that reduces the vibration. So the building has both scientific and sociological and cultural uh, reasons to be there. The theme, or the banner headline here of, of uh, this TED event, is the world around us. If we think of the world around, it, we, around us, we perceive it, both by vision, by sight, using light, and probably next is touch. <laughs> But if we go down to the nanoscale, there's a whole world around us that's really there, but we don't perceive. We don't see it, we don't feel it. So if we look at the nanoscale, if we start at our everyday scale and move down, the human hair, 100,000 nanometers in width, a cell, a typical cell, there are different sizes, but typical cells are around tens of, nan tens of microns, so tens of thousands of nanometers. Once we get to this range, we can't see anything anymore see with normal light at this level, down through bacteria and viruses, proteins, DNA, down to the atom. So the atom is incredibly small. For example, how many atoms are there in a pound coin? So one with 23 noughts. So atoms are very small. If you want to see them and you want to manipulate them, then we need a very special environment for that. If we can't see things, and because we have uh, a problem with, with, with our sight, or because it's just dark, we fumble around the room feeling our way, then we find a picture of the world by touching and feeling objects around it. Braille is a good example of the communication of information uh, by touch. Also, the, the white cane is a symbol and a method of tracking ahead as you walk along the structure, the topography of the space in front of you. The scan, the cane is scanned back and forth, and a picture can be built up of the environment ahead. Now, 30 years ago or so, every house had a device that did this at the micro level, pretty much everybody. And only the older members of the audience will recognize what that was. <laughs> a record player, which has a stylus which sits in a groove. The record rotates, the stylus feels the undulations and the bumps of the recorded sound in the groove. Okay, it's not scanning back and forth like that stick, but it's going around in a continuous groove around the spiral and picking up the forces that those bumps uh, pass to the electrical system that then eventually becomes the sound. So there's a type of microscope which does that, and it does it at an incredibly high resolution. And that's called the atomic force microscope. And when I show you this animation, it'll look almost the same. Okay, we have a a sharp tip. We have uh, a system, a distance sharp tip at the bottom of that triangle, 
We have a system for scanning it, that's the blue and red thing. There's our sample, that gold thing below. So it's like the record player, it's just <coughs> 10 million times more sensitive. It's so sensitive that tip can be sharp enough, we can make that tip have just one atom on the end. And then we can start looking at structures like this. So this is the picture that that tip felt by going over the surface. And these are atoms, <coughs> these are silicon atoms on a single crystal silicon, as you would find in a electronic uh, microchip. You can go slightly beyond that if you train the wave function functions of the front of the atom to be sharp, you can look inside a single atom. All by feeling, all by touch. So you can see the distribution of electrons inside single atoms. This is in the case of the lab of Franz Giesbos, so this is absolutely the state of the art of what can be done with this technique. In Bristol, we're known for high speed versions of this microscope. That's our claim to fame. So we're able to scan samples at video rates and beyond, rather than the many minutes it normally takes. So these are human chromosomes in liquid that we're just scanning around in our microscope. So you probably recognize chromosome number one there. <laughs> it's no friend, isn't it? <laughs> Here's DNA. So every image you get, of course, is a three-dimensional structure. It's not just a stereo pair. It's actually three-dimensional. So this is one picture of double-stranded DNA that we can look at from different directions and give that feeling from touching that world that we can see a structure in the field. Here's a lesson. This is tooth enamel with orange juice being added. We look at all those crystals of hydroxyapatite being eaten away in real time. So we can follow processes. Okay, now you should all have, I hope this works, you should all have I'm going to show you two of those movies again, but this time they're in 3D, because the information we have is 3D. So the first one uh, is a collection of those atoms on the surface of the solid. So that's actually a movie as well. We're moving around as well as collecting three-dimensional data at this micro nanoscale. Okay, so we couldn't resist this. When the iPhone came out, we thought, that multi-touch looks very cool. What could we do with our system that will use that? And so we made a multi-touch interface. This has a real practical use because it means that people who are not familiar, not geeky physicists wanting to build these pieces of equipment or wanting to use them for biology, can use this in a very intuitive way. So these are the kind of images that we're getting out of the microscope, the video rate, and now we can drag this image around with our finger. It's on this back projection here. You touch it, you can scan different areas, you can change the size of the image. You can do everything that's very familiar from smartphones. So you have the pitch, so you can do it in smartphones, and scan a larger area, and then you can move it around again. But then the second thought is, <coughs> but it could be a Friday afternoon thought is, maybe we could draw with our finger and down the scale. We can move things around. <coughs> what if we put a voltage on our finger, our probe, and we move it around? Can we draw a picture at the nanoscale with our finger? So here we are. So the rough point in the middle you see is the oxide formed on the surface of the silicon. And now we drag our finger around and we start to draw like spiral the nanoscale with our finger. So I have no idea what that's useful for. <laughs> <laughs> but we really had fun doing it. <laughs> okay, this is the really dangerous part of the talk, so I'm going to attempt uh, a live demo. So the, the beach ball interlude. So here I have a source of a stream of air. So here I have world in my hand to each ball. I'm going to show you what happens. 
Of course, so I can trap the beach ball in the flow of air. That's a bit counterintuitive. Shouldn't it blow it out? So I can move the beach ball around. I can even tilt it over. Until I go too far. And it falls off. So that doesn't really initially make sense because you would think the, the, the air would just flow these four out of the, of the stream. But what's happening is you have a stream of air which is very high velocity in the middle, low velocities on the end. So if the beach ball moves to one side, high velocity air goes round, reduces the pressure, and the beach ball is pulled back. So it's a bit like an aircraft wing. Now why don't they do that? Because we can do the same thing with light, but 10,000 times more. So you take a stream of light, a stream of photons, and you put a very small particle in it, and I'm talking about a particle that is a, uh, a thousandth of a millimeter, you can track it in the beam of light. It's for different reasons, but it's, it's, it's a similar effect. So if I move that beam of light around, I move the particle around. And we've taken that so that we can now not just do one beam of light, but many beams of light. And we can move them, we can switch them off, we can switch them on, we can change where they're focused in three-dimensional space. We do that using a dynamic hologram. So we put a laser through this dynamic hologram which can make points of light that can move these particles around. We do this in a collaboration with the uh, University of Glasgow and Miles Patches. This is how the thing looks in the, uh, the basement of the Open Air Science Building. And this is the kind of thing you can do. So you can see on the left-hand side is a real human hand wearing a black glove. On the glove are three balls. The webcam is tracking the positions of those balls, X, Y, and Z by their size. In real time, holograms are being calculated for those positions in three-dimensional space, sent to a special nickel crystal display. The, the laser splits its beams up to move those three particles on the right-hand side around exactly the same way as they <coughs> move around in real space, but 10,000 times. So now you've got a little micro hand on the back. You've got the fingertips of a hand. So as you move the left hand, the micro hand can do something. Multi-touch had to come back again, didn't it? So we've got a multi-touch table that now controls it. So we're now able to use this table, that projecting the image from the microscope. And by calculating where our fingers are on the table, calculating the holograms, and just sweeping the particles off the table uh, in real time. Well, the useful things we can do, we can trap cells. This is a leukemia cell and a killer, killer cell. So we can bring those up on the table to look at the interactions. And here they've attached, we've tried different times, different attachments, and they attach together. Second killer cell being brought up doesn't interact. So you can learn things at the cell-cell interaction level. So quite a serious side to doing this, and actually accessible and intuitive to the medics and biologists. We can make nano tools. We can make tools that can operate in nano scale. And here's come some people just uh, putting these together. So we're taking two of these micron size, thousands of a millimeter glass spheres, dragging them around in pairs. And then we're going to put that nano rod through the middle of them to give us a tool with two handles on it that our beams of light can grip. show you how we assemble it, but we assemble that into it. Oh, and there's an app for this. There's <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Richard Bowman, I think Glasgow, has written an app called iTweezers, which is up on the store, and you can simulate all this uh, in the comfort of your home. So we'd like to probe cells with these rods. We'd like to use these rods to feel the nano world, uh, and we'd like to then be able to, to image it. one of the images that we've obtained. So we've took, taken a nano rod there, driving it, controlling it by these beams of light generated by the holograms, scanning that surface of an alga, and creating this image. So we now have a system where we can feel all the way around an object and create a three-dimensional image. So we're really feeling the nano rod. Okay, quickly. Um, this is just going to show you that. Algal surface, this is the aspirin um, algal uh, in 3D 
So we're able to do things that we couldn't do with our other atomic force microscopes because we can go all the way around. And the final thing. So if you looked in uh, carefully at some of the images, you would see red circles which show where the hologram is generating the focus beam of infrared light. And of course you see the beads, these thousands of, of a millimeter bead. And you remember, if the bead is not in the middle of the beam of light, there must be a force, just like I showed with the beach ball. If the beach ball is not in the middle, there must be a force. So if we measure the distance between where the focus of the light is and where the bead is, we can measure that force. And we can measure that force in three dimensions. So what can we do with that measurement? We can store it and do some calculations. But it would be more fun if we fed it to a cyber glove. So now we feed that force to a, a virtual reality glove that lets you touch the nano world and feel what you feel. So you, you feel the Brownian motion as the molecules fluff its the particles. But do you imagine what you could do with this? You could imagine tracing your finger along a DNA molecule, feeling a cell, palpating a cell as a surgeon would palpate an organ to see if it's diseased or not. There's, there's many huge things we can do here in the future. I think we've just started at the beginning of a fantastic voyage of discovery. Thank you very much.